All right, everybody, thanks for coming out to the presentation. Hopefully you had some good lunch, enjoyed it, and won't be too tired while I present to you. Um, today I'm going to be talking about how you can leverage Velociraptor in your enterprise if you're, um, if you're a traditional enterprise you know, with an InfoSec department or maybe an MSSP type uh, organization or um, just kind of a, an incident responder. Uh, just basically what Velociraptor is and how you can apply it uh, in your usage in your daily life. Now Velociraptor is an open source, completely free uh, enterprise uh, forensics and monitoring platform and also a little bit of response in there as well. Uh, it's completely written in Go. It's compatible with Lin Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. So you can deploy it on pretty much you know, any type of endpoint that you have in your environment. It's very lightweight, very scalable. It's really flexible because of the query language behind it. And it's super fast. Uh, you know, being written in Go, a lot of that uh, you know, lends itself to being a little bit more, uh, a little bit quicker from that perspective. So continuing the architecture for Velociraptor is going to be something that a lot of folks are probably familiar with. The typical kind of client server architecture, the client will check in with the server and see if there's anything that it needs to do, any tasks that it needs to perform or any data that it needs to collect. Then we have this nice administrative interface that connects to the server and we can review all of that data that's collected from the server and then you know, review what we've collected from the client and then go on from there. Now there are various deployment modes in which you can set up Velociraptor, one of them being the standalone option where if you're inside of an enterprise and you just want to stand up a single Velociraptor server in your internal environment, you can do that and then point clients to it within your environment. Uh, you can also have multiple front ends to Velociraptor, so if there's something where you're having a high number of clients, uh, or maybe there's a different way in which they're going to have to access the manager, maybe it, there's some segmentation going on or whatnot, uh, there, there's some load balancing you can do there with multiple front ends. Uh, and as far as having Road Warrior, or you know, a lot of us work from home today, uh, having endpoints that aren't inside of the office or inside of the office network, we can deploy Velociraptor in the cloud. So we can set an instance up in AWS or GCP, and then we can have clients connect back to that. Additionally, you can build a triage package, a single binary that you can deploy if you're going uh, into an incident response scenario, or if you have a host that is not able to reach that server. For example, maybe it's an air gap environment. You can drop Velociraptor on that host. You can have it packaged with some other tools and other dependencies that you want to deploy on that host then you can go off and collect that data and perform those actions doing, doing so in that fashion. And then also we have a mode where uh, it's very simple, uh, Velociraptor GUI command, just a single liner, where you can stand up a Velociraptor server and a client on the same box. And this is really useful for performing development of artifacts, and we'll get more into artifacts in a little bit, and uh, really just a general evaluation mode. And behind Velociraptor is a core language. I know some of you may be thinking, oh, another language. But this language is very flexible and very powerful. Uh, this language is used from, you know, used for everything in Velociraptor, basically for collecting data from endpoints, performing monitoring and response, and really just managing the server in general. You'll see that as you go through Velociraptor and you start collecting some of these artifacts, this VQL, or VQL is going to be used for those operations. For example, listing files or you know, performing, you know, managing disk space and that sort of thing, as well as collecting data from endpoints. So you'll, you'll see that as you go through it. Now, what artifacts are, I mentioned artifacts, and these are essentially uh, queries packaged into a neat little container that encapsulate that expert knowledge of D for practitioners. For example, if you have this individual that knows how to collect this data from the endpoint and knows how to do so from a set of queries inside of Velociraptor, then these can be packaged into a reusable form, right? And we can use these artifacts. So, you know, Joe, Joe can go and use these artifacts. He can go take this artifact that this other person wrote and go and immediately use it in his environment and collect that data. He doesn't need to know anything about how it's retrieved. 
doesn't need to know anything like that. He can just go run the artifact, collect the data, and go from there. And you'll see there are a diff few different types of artifacts that I'll discuss in just a second. But I want to kind of get to some of the most common things that we might do whenever we're performing incident response or investigating a host, right? We may want to search for certain files of interest, or we may just want to see what files are on the box. Uh, the core plugin that Velociraptor uses for this is going to be the Glob plugin. It allows us to search by file name and search by file size or some other properties of files, but it's a really basic construct and really uh, kind of one of those core plugins that we use throughout the artifacts. You'll see it used in conjunction with other plugins and other functions, uh, but this is one of the most popular plugins that you will see. In addition to searching for content, some of you might be familiar with Yara rules. Anybody used Yara rules before? All right, awesome. So typically when we're looking for a, or trying to get a content match uh, based on the content of a file or uh, even a memory, we can use Yara, right? And the Yara plugin allows us to do that. We can search for URLs in process memory, maybe you know, some uh, file is malware or something. Uh, we can search for binaries, right? We can look for different malware signatures based on the content of those files. And there's no need to parse these files unless they actually match the content. If our Yara rule, if, you know, if we're searching and it doesn't match our rules, then there's no need to you know, parse all the data and, and go through that. So um, it saves us from those expensive operations of going through and parsing every file and then trying to find out what we want. So it's very efficient. Now for NTFS analysis, there is a lot of good stuff that Velociraptor has to offer. Uh, for example, MFT, you know, one of the things that we might check on a box is MFT and, and check, you know, when files might have dropped on disk, uh, see if a file dropped on disk. I30, right, we want to carve that slack space in the index stream. So, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff like that. Uh, USN, right, again, kind of tracking to see what files have been dropped to disk. Uh, USM will typically rotate, right? So it's something that we would constantly be watching as opposed to something that's static. And then VSS, right? We can even search uh, volume shadow service copies to see if that file was present or to see if something we're looking for is present. So it's very powerful when we're performing that NTFS analysis with Velociraptor. Drink of water. All right. Continuing, another thing we might look for is evidence of execution. Things like prefetch, background activity monitor, shim cache, and cache, and SRUM. I know you know SRUM. Yes, sir. So, um, so yeah. I mean, all of these things. These are you know things that we would look for commonly, and these are things that we can you know artifacts that we can leverage in Velociraptor. And I'll give some examples of those in just a minute. Another one is Windows event logs. Anybody ship Windows event logs? Look at Windows event logs when performing incident response? Okay, right, so we can do parsing on the endpoint. We can pre-filter before we forward logs or before we forward relevant events. This prevents us from consuming a ton of data that ultimately breaks our log management solution and then causes problems for us instead of being able to get at the thing that we're looking for in the first place sometimes. Um, and then even ETW, event tracing for Windows. We can hook into the ETW providers, the things that are ultimately feeding these Windows event logs. We can hook into that and see if there's any foul play going on, right? Maybe Windows event logs aren't always as they seem. Another thing that we tend to look at is volatile state, so WMI. You know, things like mutants, mapped memory. We can look at all this stuff with Velociraptor. There are default artifacts for us to be able to access in here, and I can't, I don't have the time to go through every single one, but just trying to give you an idea of what's possible. Now, there are different ways that we can collect this data and perform these actions. One of them is gonna be targeted collection. So when we're performing targeted collection, we are typically focusing on you know, maybe a single host, single client. 
we can specify multiple artifacts that we want to collect when we do this. And then if we want to, we can select for a lot of these artifacts to have these files uploaded so we can perform further analysis later. Maybe we want to take those files and, and you know, do our own static analysis. Also hunting, right? This is a big one. We can take these artifacts and we can apply them to a whole fleet of endpoints. Clients will enroll in a hunt when we initiate it as they come online. So you may have some clients that are disconnected at first. Maybe their the laptop is offline. Maybe they're just you know not able to connect to the server at that time. But whenever they do have uh, connectivity back to the server, they will connect back and engage in that hunt. They'll go start processing those artifacts that you told them to collect. And then we can stack results from those hunts to identify outliers or commonalities in that data. Another concept that Velociraptor leverages is notebooks. If you're familiar with Jupyter notebooks and being able to post-process data uh, from that perspective, it's very similar to that. A notebook is a way where you can take your queries that you're developing, try them out before you try to run the artifact against a client or run the artifact against a whole fleet of clients. Uh, it's a great way to be able to test that stuff and to post-process even. You can take the results from a hunt and post-process those results in a notebook right there in the hunt results. It's a very powerful way to be able to filter stuff out and again, stack that data and see what's not quite so normal or see what's common across these hosts. Now I mentioned the different types of artifacts that we have with Velociraptor. From the point of detection, there are client event artifacts and these are going to detect when something happens on a client, right? For example, um, you know, I saw this executable, or I saw this file, or I saw some user log in, uh, maybe sometime that they weren't supposed to, or they should never log in. It's a honey, right? It's honey creds, or, or something like that. Um, it's a fake user. Uh, so we can detect when things happen on the client, and then feed those results back to the server. And because of EQL, we can actually act on that data once it gets back to the server through a server monitoring artifact. And this basically turns Velociraptor into, um, and really you should be thinking of it as an engine because of this VQL. Um, we can act on those results that are sent back from the client. So we got client hits. We can then act on that. And then if we want to send an alert to something like Slack, we can do that. If we want to f perform additional collections or additional hunts, we can do that. There's I mean, the possibilities are essentially endless, right? So you can, uh, it's just a way for you to perform that detection and then respond to that. Another thing that we can do is perform remediation. Right here we have a couple examples of a quarantine right here. So if we wanna quarantine a host, we can do that. If we wanna remove a certain malicious scheduled tasks, we can do that. Obviously, in some organizations or in some instances, you will not want to do certain things like this, but the capability is there if you would like to do that. And again, you can apply somewhat of a workflow to have some of this automated from the VQL perspective. I mentioned that single binary that we can take Velociraptor and we can package it up and deploy it as a, a single binary on a host and perform that targeted collection. So we can use external tools. If we want to deploy Sysmon on a host, we can package it with Sysmon and, and have it you know, all out to all of our endpoints. If we want to deploy Bloodhound and you know, test some attack paths, we can do that. If we want to deploy it with you know, Cape files targets or you know, other binaries that help with a triage collection, we can do that. So we can take all of these external tools, all of these external dependencies and wrap them in there. And then Velociraptor will manage those. And then we can go off and get that data back. And you know, it's, it's, much more quick, you know, it's much quicker than having to go off and use this individual tool, go get, this, go get the results set. You have that all available to you then in one single package. As far as automation, there is, even though VQL can do a lot of the automation that we're referring to, there is a gRPC-based API that's available. 
So you can hook into Velociraptor and uh, you know, start a workflow essentially, start a hunt or a collection from that API. You can also get results back. You can do anything that you can do in a vCool query. So it's analogous to just sitting there and doing it from the box. So that's another way that we can help to automate some of these actions or uh, you know, really gain some efficiencies. I mentioned automation. Um, we can also send the results to Elasticstack or Splunk. There's an artifact for each of those. I do this with Security Onion. Uh, you might have seen, um, maybe if you attended uh, SOC 21, then you might have seen where I was demonstrated SOAR Lab. And that essentially is going to hook in with N8N and Velociraptor from Security Onion, but there's a lot of different ways in which you can integrate this stuff. Uh, so it's amazing to see exactly what we can do with it because the possibilities, again, are pretty much endless. Now, if we want to start digging, we can grab the latest binary from this URL right here. It should always have the latest one there. And if you want to test it out, you can run Velociraptor GUI. And what that's going to do is it's going to set up that server. It's going to set up a client. And then from there, you can go off and test your queries. You can test those artifacts and play around with it, get comfortable with it, get your feet wet, and then maybe consider standing up a deployment from there. All right, and so just going to walk through a couple things here, um, just talking through some ways in which we can identify if a file existed. Right? We may find ourselves asking, did this file ever exist on the system? And I mentioned before, there are some different ways that we can do that. Now, the Windows NTFS MFT artifact can parse the MFT and search for file names, if you'd like to do that. The Yara NTFS artifact can utilize Yara, and we can search the MFT, essentially. So it's much quicker than parsing the MFT, right? We're searching with it. We're searching with Yara first, and then we're extracting what we want. And then I mentioned earlier, the USN can also be used. Uh, the artifact can be used to parse the USN journal. The USN journal is constantly tracking that, you know, constantly rotating, and we can watch that and store those hashes, essentially, into a SQLite database, and then we can search for those later that is maintained, and we can then have a record of all the hashes that ever exist on this host. And that's what this local hashes USN right here will do. Then I mentioned the I-30 and the VSS as well. But aside from that, I want to go into a little bit of a demo about scanning process memory. I mentioned that we can do this with Yara, and that this is quite common, right, with fileless malware for them to reside in memory and not drop files to disk. And this is a very trivial demonstration, but just to get the point across, I'm going to pop over here, and the resolution will probably change a bit. Okay. So what we have here, this is just a Windows 10 VM, and I've run the Velociraptor GUI command on this box. And now it's set up the server and clients. I can see the server here, and again, I apologize for the resolution. Some things may be cut off. But we can see the server here, and what we'll have here is just some, some status information and you know, the currently connected clients, some disk space information. And then we can also go over here to this little icon. This is gonna play nicely. Okay, oh, that's a hunt, okay. And this is where we would kick off a hunt if we wanted to do so. We're not gonna do, so, do this right at the moment, but just wanted to kind of navigate towards that. Here's where we have all of the artifacts. For example, I mentioned the Yara, there's a detection Yara glob artifact, and it's going to essentially return a list of files, right, and then run Yara over that list. I mean, as, as you can see, we can scroll down. You'll see a ton of different artifacts for Linux, Mac OS, Windows, all that kind of stuff, but I don't want to derail from this other discussion too much. Uh, I'm going to go over to a notebook, and we're going to work with this process memory real quick. We're going to do this demonstration. Okay, so I've got, you can't really see anything right here. Uh, there aren't any results right now, so you won't see anything, any data available. But I'm going to click to edit this cell and try to drag this up so you can see it. But 
essentially what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do a PS list and we're gonna look for any processes with the name of notepad, right? And then, this is just really to narrow it down. Um, this is probably not a realistic demo case because you wouldn't necessarily be looking for notepad, obviously. But uh, to demonstrate the point, we're gonna look for any processes with the name of notepad or with notepad in the name. And then we're gonna apply the process accessor to those. And we're gonna apply a Yara rule. And this Yara rule is typically, is you can't see me. A very simple rule, you know, just text. Um, so we're gonna go over here and we're actually going to launch notepad. We just type, you can't see me in there. We're not gonna save it, right? So this is all about seeing if we can find something that's in memory, right? And while this may be benign, um, there are lots of great use cases and reasons why you would wanna do this in the real world. So we're gonna go off and run our query here. When we run that, we're applying again that process accessor. So it's taking the process memory, it's treating it as if it were a file, and then it's applying the Yara rule to that. And so we can see in this somewhat academic example, we have the droid we were looking for, right? We can see you. So we can do this with real malware, right? We don't have to do it with Notepad. But this is a capability that we have at our disposal. Just one way that we can leverage Velociraptor for scanning that process memory. Now let's go with a, another example. Let's see, what do we have here? Play from current slide. All right, and this is just an example of the query here. And please do try this out at home if you get a chance to. And we can see here that we were able to scan that process memory. And if we were to use the Windows detection process memory artifact that's already built into Velociraptor, we can do this from a detection perspective. We can be looking in non-standard locations or in certain locations for these binaries or for these executions and identify that in memory. Now another thing that's pretty tricky and, and a, lot of, a lot of tools can't get this right. Windows can't get this right natively. Process spoofing, parent process spoofing. Right, a lot of platforms rely on process creation logs from things like Sysmon and how they track those parent-child relationships. Now, a lot of times, I'm not gonna say a lot of times, but these relationships can be spoofed, right? This means that no matter what you're sending to your SIM, you're collecting all of the Sysmon data and you're sending it to your SIM or your log management platform and you're killing it with logs, you're never gonna see this because you're gonna see what they want you to see, right? And this is all because of the Windows Create Process API also. It doesn't really help because it allows non-admin users to do this. So as a non-admin user, you can spoof the parent process of your process. And we're gonna demonstrate that. Select My Parent was written by Didier Stevens. He's very active in the community. And it allows you to spoof the parent process ID or the parent process of a process, right? So we're gonna try this out with OneDrive.exe. We're gonna flip over here. That's not what I want. Okay, so let me get over here into a blank terminal and make sure everybody can see that, yep. Okay, so what I'm gonna do first is Go to task manager. I'm just gonna get the PID, process ID of OneDrive right here. I've just opened task manager, click to the details here. I'm gonna get 4760 is the one that I want to emulate. So I want it to look like OneDrive.exe spawn this process as the attacker. So I'm gonna use select my parent.exe and the process or the executable that I want to execute as notepad, and I want to make it look like it was spawned by OneDrive. 
So let me double check one t before I screw up this demo. 4760. All right, so that quickly, uh, we've launched Notepad, and its process ID is 5356. Okay? Now let's go over to the sysmon logs here. And again, I know this might be painful, so please bear with me. Trying to adjust this here. And let me actually define Notepad. Okay. I'm gonna move this up. Okay, let me just go to the details, make it a little easier. Okay. So now if we go, here it is. Notepad.exe, Sysmon reports this, right? The image. We were working with Notepad, we were spawning Notepad. But if we look at the parent process ID, it's 4760, and it shows the parent process as OneDrive, which we know is not the case. That's pretty scary. Pretty scary that even Sysmon, that we all rely on to have, you know, that ground truth and to ship to our SIMs and our log management platforms, even Sysmon thinks the parent process is OneDrive. So how do we get at the ground truth? What we can do here is leverage ETW. I mentioned ETW before, event tracing for Windows. And we can use this query right here to actually watch ETW and this is the specific GUID right here that we're looking for. And we can look for anything where uh, Notepad is in those event details. And we can get an idea of where there's some outliers there. So we're gonna do that real quick. Pop back over here. All right, and so I'm just going to refresh this real quick. Okay, so let me stop this. I've got this notebook here. This is for parent process ID spoofing. This is the query that I mentioned just a second ago. And we're watching that ETW provider and we're looking for anything with notepad in the event data. So we're gonna save that and we're gonna execute, select my parent again. If I can drag this up a little bit or scroll down. Okay, so we're just gonna do it for a different process. Let me actually kill this other one so there's no confusion. Wait, let me get this out and out of the way. Cover that. Okay. Wait, that one's open. Whoop. Whoop, whoop. I'm jumping all around. Somebody stop me. All right. Yes, clear that. Okay, so I just want to demonstrate here how, again, with select my parent, we're going to run it with Notepad and assume the parent process of OneDrive. Right, so Sysmon knows no better. And that process, 8208 or 8208, looks like we just got a result here. I look down here, it's the one. No, we will see a result here, right? Okay, so here is where we see the, where is it? Sorry, I'm jumping around again. Process ID, 8208, right? Notepad.exe in the event data and then the OneDrive parent process ID of 4760. But if we actually look in the system data, it's gonna be 1696. So it's completely different, right? But how would we identify that? Uh, how, you know, we can identify the process that actually executed that. In a different way, we can use the, there's an artifact, the ETW detect process spoofing artifact. And we can run this as a client monitoring artifact, and this is gonna watch for inconsistencies between those parent process IDs and what's reported in the event data and the system data. Okay, so I've actually already got this running. If I go over here, 
and I click on the results here. I'll scroll down a little bit. And it does take, sometimes it'll take a minute to buffer on the side until you get the result back. But we can see here, essentially, this is a different result set, but essentially what we will find is that the real parent, and again, I apologize because of the resolution, the real parent right here, and the suspicious process right here, we have select my parent as the real parent, the suspicious process of notepad, and then if we, let's see if I can scroll over, take it down to the bottom. Uh, let me scroll. Come on. Yeah, let me control minus maybe. Oh, it's too small. Oh, I think it's down here. Okay. All right. So let me go in a little bit. Okay. So anyway, we have the real parent over here. Select my parent .exe. Then we have the purported parent right here. OneDrive.exe, right? So, again, we can see the actual parent process ID in the system data, and in the event data, we're going to notice the spoofed parent process ID. And then we took that query and implemented that client monitoring artifact. And now we can see the suspicious process of notepad.exe, the real parent of selectmyparent.exe, and then the claimed parent, the one that was purported to be the parent process, which is OneDrive. Now, there's another thing that you could do. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily demonstrate it today, but uh, there was Adam Chester from XPNSec did have a blog that he wrote about uh, subverting ETW. So there's some very good research about that, and essentially the, I believe it was the com plus ETW enabled variable. If you set that, then you can actually even subvert ETW's own hooks, right? Or the process's hooks in ETW, it won't be registered. So even in this case, we might not even see it from the ETW perspective. I'm not going to go into all that, but just something to consider that, you know, even with Sysmon and even with ETW, you always have to be careful about know, how you're looking at things and, and, you know, and have those different layers and, and be able to um, look at that in different ways. Now, that is all I have at the moment. Um, if you would like to hear more about Velociraptor, you can follow Velocidex on Twitter. I'm also up there, and Mike Cohen. Uh, there's a GitHub repository for Velociraptor right here. Also, these articles and these docs over here, uh, medium.com slash Velociraptor IR. It's a really great resource to be able to test out Velociraptor and apply some of these use cases similar to what I've discussed. Uh, there's also a Discord if you have issues or questions or feature requests. Uh, Mike and others are very active on there answering questions. Uh, that is about all I have, unless you guys have any questions, and I would be glad to answer them. Unless, would you rather me do the, uh, the other first? Which way? Yep. Yep. Okay, so, again, what is, we're going to do the giveaways first. Uh, what is going to be that container for the Velociraptor query language, those various queries, and that expert knowledge to be encapsulated in the first one? Yep. Yes. All right. And I didn't even tell you what you won, because that's how awesome I am. It's a mystery. But you won this Alpha Networks USB wireless adapter. <laughs> yes, sir. Appreciate it. Yep. All right. Now, let me do this right. So Linux basics for hackers up for grabs. All right, so I'm trying to think of a good question. I can never think of these. Um, what is one way that we can? How do we test our queries? Or uh, okay, yep. 
Notebooks, okay, very good. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. All right, any other questions about the presentation? Now that, now that's done, yes. Right, yeah, so, so in that instance, you would see uh, the system would report the same as the event data, right? So, um, yeah, because we saw that, that difference between like the actual system data and the event data, um, it's, you know, it's kind of where the, the difference comes in and, and, and where ETW is seeing it and then Sysmon is seeing it because it's sub subscribing to that event data, right? Awesome. Anybody else have any questions, concerns, or snide remarks? Yep. Yeah, so that, um, it, it will, that's right. So it, it, it takes an argument, right, like the path, right, or a path. So you can filter it down, right, and you can modify the artifact itself. So um, it's essentially what you want to be looking for or watching for, right? So you may, not, you may watch everything, you may not watch everything. You may watch specific things, right, specific um, named processes or, or whatnot that are likely to have that happen, right? Yep, yes ma'am. Right, so, um, a little bit of feedback, but, uh, yeah, so, so essentially, you know, there's the, kind of the Sysmon level subversion, right, where you're, it's actually, it's only hooking into the event data from ETW, right, and then there's the ETW subversion where uh, you're basically telling the process not to have its .NET assemblies inspected, and there's no hooking into ETW for that process from that perspective, right. So like what evidence of Velociraptor's usage itself, right? So there, there's certain, you know, like directory structure and everything. Um, so you do have that, and obviously you have the agent and um, server communication. Um, but but that's, that's essentially, you know, it's, it's kind of a trade-off, right? So um, as far as the evidence itself, um, anything that you collect, right, is not necessarily stored on the, the server. The results of the query, or on the endpoint, the results of the queries are sometimes, right, Some, and then, like, they're also sent back to the, the server, right, so there's certain data that's kept. I won't say all the queries are stored on the, on the endpoint or anything like that or all the data that you collect is. It just, you know, it depends on if you're sending that data up to the server and then the results of the queries are sent up to the server, essentially. But there could be things like, um, you know, if you're maintaining a client-side file hash database, if you're watching things like US Journal and you're tracking all the hashes that are on there, then uh, that will reside on the client because that's how we keep track of that, but, uh, you know, just, it's those particular cases. Yep. Yeah, so actually, that's something I've actually uh, started to look into is, uh, you know, tampering, right? So as far as with Velociraptor and kind of disablement, so, um, right, so uh, I think with anything like any EDR or any, any kind of platform like that, um, it's important to have some, some ways to identify that, so. Um, I mean, you can absolutely write an artifact right now for it, right? The power of BeQuil is that you can do anything you want with it right now. So, anybody else have any questions? Yes. Uh, I can't speak to that. I can say that uh, I know Mike is very uh, adamant about you know, open source and has developed some, you know, quite a few and worked on a few open source projects. So um, I don't foresee it going to any licensed version, but, you know, obviously I have no control over that. But, um, but yeah, I, I foresee a bright future as far as maintaining an OS or an open source, um, you know, long-term initiative. So. Yeah, oh, okay, well, awesome. Yeah. Right. 
Right, right. I've heard well, maybe like Insight RDR. Yep. So, okay. All right. Well, cool. Anyone else have any questions? All right. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>